Hello, my name is Cormac Ryan. I'm Professor of Clinical Rehabilitation at Teesside University. Pain is a wonderful thing. It is our body's natural alarm system, which protects us from all manner of dangers. When we place our hand on a hot surface, it makes us pull back so we don't burn ourselves. When we break our leg during a football match, it stops us from continuing to run on that leg, potentially worsening the injury and makes us go to the doctor. In some very rare cases, there are people born without the ability to feel pain. Such individuals often have very difficult lives where they are constantly injuring themselves because they lack natu nature's protective alarm system. The purpose of pain is protection. It draws our attention to a potential problem and gets us to do something about it. We need pain for our very survival and it does a wonderful job at keeping us safe. However, it is not uncommon for the awesome alarm system to go wrong, constantly firing long after normal heating times. This is known as persistent pain. The system thinks it is keeping you safe and it is in a way in that you are too sore to do anything that will damage you. But frustratingly, you are also often too sore to do the normal everyday things that keep you healthy and happy. Does this sound a bit like you? In the UK, approximately 30 to 50% of people living in the UK have persistent pain. It is extremely common. An individual's understanding of their condition will influence how they go about managing it. If our understanding of persistent pain is incorrect, then you're more likely to ha make inappropriate decisions about how to manage the pain. Better understanding will help you to manage your pain better and help you to make better and more informed choices for your health and well-being. So in this session, I will try to give you a new understanding of your pain and how your pain system works. Before you move on, I would like to ask you to ask yourself the following questions. What are you hoping to get out of this online session? What do you think is causing your pain? What do you think your pain is telling you? Why do you think you have the pain? What is its purpose? Pause this presentation now for five minutes to write your answer to these questions. Then press play when you are ready to move on. Do you recognise this chap? This is a picture of René Descartes, recently back from the hairdressers. He was a French philosopher from the 1600s. He was a genius. He put forward an idea of how pain works, which was revolutionary at the time. Take a look at the drawing of a person burning their foot in a fire accidentally. Descartes proposed that when we injure ourselves, this triggers pain receptors in our tissues, which send pain messages up our nerves to the brain telling the brain that our tissues are in pain and ringing the pain alarm bell in the brain. This was a huge step forward in science at the time. I suspect you are thinking to yourself that it's not a bad summary of our current understanding of pain. This understanding implies a very clear one-to-one -one relationship between tissue injury and pain. If Descartes' model is correct, then the following are true. If you have pain, then you must have injured tissues somewhere in the body. The greater the amount of pain, the greater the amount of injury. And if pain persists long-term, that must mean the tissue injury has not healed. Ask yourself, do you agree with all of these statements? Again, take a minute to think about your answer. Pause the session if you need to, and then press play again when you are ready. Would you believe these statements are incorrect? They are overly simplistic and based upon that old Descartes model. Scientists have learned a great deal about how pain works over the past 50 years, but very little of this knowledge has filtered through to the average person on the street. This has meant that many people living with persistent pain and many clinicians treating people with persistent pain 
are basing what they do on an outdated understanding of the condition. I'm going to give you a mind-blowing insight into how your pain system actually works. It is really challenging and in many ways hard to believe. If I just told you about it, I don't think you would believe me. So instead, I'm going to show you. The best way to understand how your pain works is to understand how your sight works. Take a look at this image of a box with many different colored panels. What color do you think the panel in the black circle is? It looks brown, right? And what color do you think the panel in the yellow circle looks like? It looks orange, right? They certainly do not look the same color. Now look what happens as I place a white background behind these two boxes. The orange colored panel at the front appears to change colour to brown. Now it looks like both squares are the same brown colour. Now watch again as I remove the white background and return to the image as it was. The brown coloured panel at the front appears to change colour again back to its original orange colour. You can repeat this again and again and again and you will see the front panel change from orange to black brown and back again as if by magic each time you change the background behind the squares. When I show this illusion, illusion to people on a big screen they rarely truly believe it. It seems to defy logic. Something does not change colour simply by changing the background behind it. People think it must be a trick and the computer simply changes the colour of the panel from orange to brown when it places the white background up. I can assure you that this is not the case, but if you don't believe me, you can perform this illusion yourself in a Blue Peter style. Simply print off this image, then place a plain white A4 sheet over it. Hold it up to the light and with a pencil mark out the outline of the spaces where the two panels are. And with the scissors cut out the spaces for these two panels in the plain white A4 sheet. Now look at the image with no obstructions. The top panel will look brown and the front panel will look orange. Now place your A4 sheet directly over the image so that you can only see those two panels. You will now see that the orange panel at the front appears to have turned brown and both panels are the same brown colour, just as it has appeared on this screen. Go on, do it. You won't believe it until you do. This will be an important step in understanding your pain better. Understanding our pain better is helped by understanding how our visual system works. It gives us a completely new understanding of how our visual system works, these illusions. And it can lead to a completely different understanding of how our pain works. But how does it work? Can we explain the physiology behind this visual illusion? How does sight work? Well, light reflects images in the surrounding area. The, travel, the light travels in through the lens of our eyes and is projected onto the retina at the back of the eyeball. Here, it stimulates light receptors called rods and cones that convert the light energy into electrical messages, which travel via the optic nerve to the parts of the subconscious brain that deal with sight. In this part of the brain, there's a little person. Let's call her Sheila. Sheila is surrounded by millions of virtual jigsaw pieces. As the light information comes in, in the form of electrical messages, Sheila constructs an image of what she believes is going on around you in real time to give you an instantaneous coherent image of the world. Do not think of sight as an input to your brain. It is an output of your brain. It is a creation of your subconscious. Everything you are seeing right now is not necessarily what is there but your Sheila's prediction of what is there. And when it comes to that prediction everything matters. Not just the light information coming in through your eyes, but also your previous experiences, your expectations, 
your beliefs, your attitudes, your understanding of the world, all of these will influence the image that Sheila creates for you. Let's look at that image again. Remember, this is a two-dimensional image, but it is drawn to look like a three-dimensional image. Take a look at the area in front of the box. There is a darkness there, which looks like a shadow, suggesting that there is a light source coming from behind the box and the front area is shaded. This is not the case, but the image is arranged to give that impression. Now, take a look at these two panels again. Both of these panels are in fact the identical shade of brown in reality. So the same intensity of light is reflecting off them, both, and going in through our eye right now. That light is projected onto your retina stimulates your rods and cones and is converted to electrical messages sent via your optic nerve to Sheila. When Sheila gets this information she would usually come to the prediction that these are two identically coloured brown panels and so create that image. But she does not because when it comes to sight everything matters. Sheila takes into account the apparent shading. If she is getting the same intensity of light from both panels but one is in shadow that one must be a brighter colour and so Sheila makes the prediction that the panel in the shaded area must be brighter. So she makes it orange. So the colour we all see is orange. Now when we place a white background behind the two panels, Sheila no longer has to adjust her prediction based upon the apparent shade and we see the colour of the panel as it truly is, brown. Sheila is quite amazing. Her prediction allows us to correctly judge colour in a variety of complicated and dense environments like woodlands and forests. You can imagine this ability has been extremely useful to our early ancestors when they were hunting and gathering to survive. It gives us a great biological advantage, this predictive system, which is why we have it. But occasionally, Sheila can be tricked and get things wrong, as is the case here. So what we see is not necessarily an accurate representation of what is physically there. It is our subconscious brain's interpretation of what is there. Our subconscious brain decides what we see 100% of the time, all of the time. When it comes to vision, Sheila is in charge. One of the most interesting things is that even though you know that both squares are brown, even with that information now in the conscious part of your brain, when you take away the white background, Sheila shows you an orange square again. The subconscious prediction model kicks back in and simply ignores the conscious information you bring to the table. You don't consciously control what you see, but it is very real. Everyone else watching this session is seeing the same thing. Even though it's a creation of your mind, it is a real thing. While this example of, is a vision, actually all of our senses work in the same way. Sound, taste, touch and smell. These are all outputs of our subconscious brains. I want you to start thinking about pain in the same way. Pain is not an input to your brain. Pain is an output of your subconscious brain. Nociception or danger messages coming from your body are inputs to your brain and these can influence what you feel just like light can influence what you see. But the brain is boss. Sheila is in charge. She decides what you feel or what you see 100% of the time, all of the time. Now let's meet Sheila's pain equivalent. The subconscious part of the brain that deals with pain. Her name is Asumta. She's from the Department of Health and Safety. No one likes health and safety, but where would we be without it? You will notice that Asumta looks curiously like Lady Justice, with her blindfold, sword and scales. Her job is to do unbiased risk assessments, and where necessary, enforce strict safety measures. That's why she carries the sword. If Assumpta makes the assumption, see what I did there, on balance, based on all the information she is getting, 
that you were in danger. She will want to draw the conscious person's attention to it, that's you, and get you to do something about it, to protect the body. And the best way of doing this is to give you pain. This is because the purpose of pain is to protect you. If a sumta assumes you are in a small amount of danger, she will give you a small amount of pain. If a sumta assumes you are in a large amount of danger, she will give you a large amount of pain. However, don't fall into the trap that if you simply learn about how pain works, that you can consciously influence a sumta by telling her not to be so protective. Unfortunately, in the same way you cannot force yourself to see both squares as brown in the visual illusion, even when you knew they were both brown, so you cannot force yourself to consciously not feel the pain. That is why she wears the blindfold. You cannot bias her with conscious thought, I'm afraid. If it were that simple, then healthcare professionals like me would be out of a job. In this brief session about pain, it is really hard to get your head around the new way of looking at pain. But the first steps towards doing that is to disprove the biomedical model put forward by Descartes 400 years ago, that if you have pain, this is because you are injured, and the greater the pain, the greater the amount of injury. So let's try and disprove that. Take a look at this picture of a man's boot with a six inch nail shoved through it. This was from an article published in the British Medical Journal, one of the most respected medical journals in the world. A builder, aged 29, came to the accident and emergency department in Leicester, having jumped down onto a six inch nail. The man was in agony. The smallest movement of the nail was painful despite being given some really strong painkillers such as fentanyl. When they cut away his boot, a miraculous cure appeared to have occurred and there was not a scratch on him. Unbelievably, the nail had penetrated between the toes and the foot was entirely uninjured. The man did the lottery that evening and won £80 million. Pounds. Well, OK, I made the last bit up about the lottery, but the rest of it is true. This is a perfect example of where you can experience terrible pain despite having little or no injury. Now, let's look at the reverse situation. Let me introduce you to Hannibal. Hannibal works in the infamous Circus of Horrors. In this picture, Hannibal is at the Edinburgh Festival trying to break his own Guinness World Record by pulling a four ton van over a 100 meter distance along Princess Street with two meat hooks inserted through his back. As you can see from the tracks on Hannibal's back, this is not the first time he's done this. Take a look at Hannibal's face. No sign of pain there. In fact, he seems quite pleased about the whole thing. This is another amazing example of the significant, uh, of significant tissue injury with little or no pain. Again, if pain only happens when you are injured, events like this should not be possible. That is because pain is not an accurate marker of the health of our tissues. It is a marker of how concerned our subconscious is about the state of the tissues. It is a marker of how concerned assumpta is about the state of our tissues. In this next slide, we try to explain the underlying biology. So here it goes. Let's talk through the following scenario. You are hammering a nail into the wall to hang up a picture. When you strike your thumb instead of the nail head and meanwhile you are drawing back the hammer ready for the next blow. If something doesn't happen you will keep hammering that thumb, not a good idea. When the hammer hits the thumb this will stimulate receptors at the end of nerves in your thumb. These are not pain receptors, we do not have pain receptors in our bodies. Don't forget that pain is a creation of our subconscious brains. What we have are danger receptors that respond to different types of stimulation, such as hot and cold and mechanical stimulation. These receptors, when stimulated enough, and a hammer blow will probably be enough, will send a danger message, not a pain message, but a danger message from the top of the nerve in the thumb 
all the way to nerves in the spinal cord. This is just one long pathway. When the danger message gets to the end of the first nerve and reaches the second nerve that sits in the spinal cord, there needs to be a way of passing the message on between the small gap that sits between them. This is done through neurotransmitters. These are chemicals that are released from the end of nerve 1 to communicate with nerve 2. When enough neurotransmitters travel across the gap, they bind with receptors that sit on nerve 2. When this happens, little gates on the skin of nerve 2 open up and allow negatively charged ions into the second nerve. When enough negatively charged ions come in, this causes the second nerve to depolarize or fire and relay the danger message up to the brain. When the message reaches the brain where Assumpta sits and says danger in the thumb, Assumpta asks how dangerous is this really? Remember, up to this point, there has been no pain. This is an entirely unconscious process, happening within a split second. Asunta now has to decide, based upon a range of factors, whether or not to produce pain. This decision is not consciously controlled by you. You are completely unaware of it. This decision is not just based upon the danger message coming from the body, but also our previous experiences, your expectations, beliefs, attitudes, knowledge, and the external environment. So Sumta will be thinking, okay, I've received lots of danger messages from my thumb. My thumb is roughly where I have struck with a hammer. The likelihood is that the tissues in my thumb are in danger. There could be fracture or a wound. Also, my arms and backswing for another hit. I need to draw the conscious attention to it and get something done immediately. So I will give pain and give the perception it is coming from the thumb. Now she passes this message to the conscious, to you, in the form of pain. Wow, you're quite the looker. Immediately, you shout out in pain. You drop the hammer and you clutch your injured thumb. Well done, alarm system. Now Assumpta doesn't just receive messages coming up the spinal cord. She also sends lots of messages down the spinal cord to the gap between the first and second nerves. Some of these nerves can excite and some can inhibit danger message transmission. If Assumpta thinks that the situation is dangerous, she will give pain. But if she thinks the situation is even more dangerous than the evidence coming to her would suggest, she can send exciting messages down the spinal cord. These cause the release of more neurotransmitters into the gap between the first and second nerves, which results in more binding with receptors, more gates being opened and more negatively charged ions flowing into the second nerve making the second nerve depolarize or fire more frequently. As a result, you get more danger messages sent up that second nerve to the brain without any changes in the thumb. This is what they call a positive feedback loop. The brain sends messages down the spinal cord which can directly increase the amount of danger messages coming up to it. When Assumpta receives these additional danger messages, and balances everything up, there is an increased likelihood that she will interpret the situation as dangerous and thus give even more pain. Think back to the builder with the nail between his toes, who was in excruciating pain even though he had no injury, and how this process can help us understand the biology of why he was in so much pain. However, if Assumpta thinks the situation is dangerous, but actually less dangerous, than the evidence coming up to her would suggest, she can send inhibiting messages down the spinal cord. These cause the release of chemicals that block neurotransmitters into the gap between the first and second nerves, which results in less binding with docking stations, fewer gates being opened, and fewer negatively charged ions flowing into the second nerve, making it depolarize or fire less frequently. As a result, you get fewer danger messages sent up to the second nerve to the brain, 
without any changes in the thumb. This is what they call a negative feedback loop. The brain sends messages down the spinal cord which can directly reduce the amount of danger messages coming up it. When a sumta receives fewer danger messages and balances everything up, there's a reduced likelihood that she will interpret the situation as less dangerous or as dangerous and thus give less pain. Think back to Hannibal who pulls vans with a meat hooks attached to his back who has little or no pain and how this process can help us understand the biology of why he has little or no pain. Now let's move rapidly forward through the days and months after your hammer and thumb incident. You are still in lots of pain. You went to your GP the same day as the incident. He said it just looked bruised, but to come back to him if it didn't get any better. The next day it swelled up the size of a balloon. You went to A&E, got an x-ray, and you were told it was a really bad fracture, but that they don't tend to put thumbs in a cast, and it would heal in time. They gave you painkillers and sent you away. The pain just kept getting worse. It was stopping you sleeping, so you went back to your GP two weeks later, and he gave you more painkillers and said to rest the thumb. Try not to do too much with it. Eight weeks later, the swelling has gone, and the thumb looks normal. But it feels weak and is still really sore. Even the slightest touch is excruciating and now the pain has spread to most of the hand and up the forearm. You were told that the fracture will have healed. You insist on getting an x-ray and you were told that the fracture uh, uh, but your GP agrees with you that it needs an, another x-ray. You go you have the x-ray and it shows the fracture is healed. The healthcare professionals are still scratching their heads. Now they think it might be one of the tendons or the ligaments. Six months down the line, you've been off work with the pain for a long time now. No one seems to know the cause. They tell you it is healed, but it feels worse than ever. You now have persistent pain. How can we explain this? Well, let's go back to our biology. At the gap between the first and second nerve, there is a bottleneck the system simply cannot deliver all the messages that want to be sent. It is a bit like the post office over Christmas time. Demand outstrips resources. The post office overcomes this by employing more staff during this period and extending working hours. If you have ever received a parcel on the 23rd of December at 6.30 in your pyjamas or bleary eyed, you will know what I mean. In a similar way, your danger message system adapts. Your body adapts to this new situation. How does it adapt? Well, firstly, your body builds more receptors or more docking stations for the neurotransmitters. It makes the gates stay open longer and it increases the number of ions in the second nerve when it is at rest, making it easier to fire. This is called sensitization. Furthermore, these chemicals changes spill over to neighboring danger pathways, recruiting more help to protect you. When this happens, the pain appears to move and the area of pain can get bigger. Has this happened to you? Can you recognize this pattern in you? Did the pain start in one area and then seem to move and the area of pain get bigger? These physiological changes at this junction and at a number of other junctions along the pathway result in far more danger messages getting sent to the brain system, getting sent to a sumpta saying danger in the foot, even though things at the thumb are improving and the fracture is healing well. Once this sensitization occurs, it can become slow to shift and can stay even after the tissue has fully healed. It is a bit like an overactive fire alarm that keeps ringing long after the fire has been put out and the fire bridge 
Fire Brigade had been and gone. Poor Assumpta is working in overdrive, as all the information she is getting is that your thumb, and now even your hand, is in a great deal of danger, and doctors have said that there is nothing that can be done. How dangerous is this really? It's very dangerous. Thus, she needs to protect that thumb, and the best way to do that is by giving lots of pain, because the purpose of pain is protection, even though the thumb itself has healed. To explain this situation to my patients, I often use the following story. Imagine you get a new car. It is your pride and joy. You drive it to work, spend 10 minutes parking it super carefully so you don't scuff the wheels off the curb. Then you lock it, set the alarm and go to your work. You work on the fourth floor and there is no elevator so it takes a good 5-10 to 10 minutes before you get up to your office. Get a cup of tea and sit down at your desk to switch on your computer. Meanwhile, outside there is an opportunistic thief. He saw you spending 10 minutes trying to park your car and this drew his attention as he peered out from behind some bushes. He thinks that's a nice car. He waits for you to leave then strolls over to your car, looks around then he smashes the car window, grabs your fancy car radio and runs off down the road and the car alarm goes off. You hear the alarm. At first you ignore it, assuming it is someone else's. Then you start to think about your new car. You stand up and look out your window. You see the lights in your car flashing, the broken window, and you can just make out someone running down the road. You let out a shout. Oi! But he's long gone. You go down the stairs, you call the police and the RAC. The police take your statement and then the RAC guy replaces your car radio and mends your window. Just... Before he leaves, the RAC guy says he will give you a little tip and he turns the sensitivity of your car alarm right up. Next time any thief comes by, he will get quite a shock, he says. Then off he goes and you go back up your four flights of stairs. Meanwhile, the thief has been observing all this hidden behind more bushes. As everyone leaves, he thinks to himself, another radio to steal. He wanders over to your car, but as soon as he lays his hand on the window, the alarm goes off. He jumps back in fright. You jump up from your desk, shout, Oi! at the window. He looks up and sees you, then runs off down the road. You go down your four flights of stairs, but when you reach the car, you are delighted to find that there's not a scratch on it. You turn off the car alarm, but you leave the car alarm sensitivity turned up. It worked a treat and protected your car perfectly. So the last thing you want to do is turn that sensitivity down. You go back up your stairs, sit back down at your computer. Five minutes later, the car alarm goes off. You jump back up and look out your window to see an elderly couple walk past your car. One of them must have just glanced off your car. Your car was in no danger, but because of the sensitized car alarm, it, the alarm itself has been set off. And it sounds just the same as when the car window was smashed. So you go down the stairs, turn off the alarm, but you leave the sensitivity right up because you need that to protect your car and it's doing an excellent job. Then you go back up your four flights of stairs, sit down at your computer. Five minutes later, the car alarm goes off. You jump back up and look out your window to see a pigeon sitting on your car. The car is in no danger, but the weight of the pigeon was enough to set off the car alarm and the alarm sounds just the same as when the car window was smashed. So you go downstairs, turn off the alarm, but you leave the sensitivity of the alarm right up, because you need that to protect your car, and it is doing an excellent job. Then you go back up your four flights of stairs and sit down at your computer. Five minutes later, you guessed it, the car alarm goes off. The problem is no longer the broken window or the stolen car radio. The problem is the overprotective car alarm system, which is interrupting your life and stopping you from doing your normal activities of daily living. This is what happens in persistent pain. The problem is no longer in the tissues. The problem is an overprotective pain alarm system, which is working hard to keep you safe, and it is doing a really good job in that respect. And it is but, and it is stopping you from injuring yourself. But it is also stopping you 
from doing your usual daily activities which keep you healthy and happy. Okay, so we've seen some examples of real life situations to show that tissue injury and pain are not the same thing. That you can have terrible pain and no injury, but you can also have terrible injury with no pain. We have talked through the biology of how this can happen in order to explain how so many of us can have persistent pain long after our tissues will have healed. Also, we have covered how pain is influenced not just by physical things, but also by our thoughts, our fears and our worries, as well as the external environment, the people and places around us. How all of this, all of these things, influence our unconscious brain's decision to turn the pain alarm system up or down, how they influence our assumpta. To finish, I would like to show you a couple of examples of scientific studies which further help to support this understanding of pain. In the first of these studies, which comes from Canada, 292 people over the age of 65 were given the regular winter flu vaccination. However, one half of the group were told about the associated risks in a negative way, and the other half were told about the associated risks in a positive way. In the negative way, patients were told 40% of people who receive this injection get a sore arm. In the positive way, patients were told 60% of people who receive this injection do not get a sore arm. The information was the same, but it was framed differently to be more positive or more negative. Patients knew they were going to get different information leaflets, but they did not know how that information might be different. Now, when we look at the results on the next slide, we see light grey bars represent those who received the positive information and the dark grey bars represent those who received the negative information. As you can see, those who were told about the associated risks in a negative way were more likely to experience those side effects. In this case, the physical factors would have been identical for both groups. The only difference was the patient's belief about how safe or dangerous the intervention was. The more dangerous it was suggested to be, the more likely the protective pain system kicked in. Now let's look at the next study one of my favorite studies published in the New England Medical Journal one of the one of the biggest medical journals in the world and it was undertaken in the United States of America in this study people with knee osteoarthritis pain volunteered to take part in a surgical study participants were randomly assigned to one of three different groups people in group 1 were given a general anesthetic a small incision was made in the knee and they received arthroscopic debridement where the surfaces of the knees were smoothed. People in group two were given a general anesthetic, a small incision was made in the knee, and they received arthroscopic lavage where saline fluid was passed through the knee joint to get rid of any loose bodies or debris. People in group three were given a general anesthetic, a small incision was made in the knee, and they received placebo surgery or pretend surgery. In the placebo surgery, the surgeon did nothing more than make the incision, and then after the same length of time as it would be open for the other surgeries, he closed it up. Participants were unaware of what group they were in. Participants were monitored regularly for up to two years. This graph shows the outcome for the three groups in three different colors. The graph shows pain levels, the lower a person is on the graph, the less pain they would experience. My first question is, would you want to be in the placebo group? I know I wouldn't. My second question is, what colour group you, you would like to be in? Either the green, the brown or the red. I know which colour I would want to be in. Remember, the lower you are on this chart, the less pain you have. I don't know about you, but I would like to be in the green group. Amazingly, the green group 
is the placebo group. Now, there was no statistically significant difference between the groups for pain at any time point. But there was a clear tendency for the placebo group to have less pain in the early weeks and months post-surgery. As you will also see, all three groups improved by about 20%, which is a clinically useful reduction in pain. What this shows us is that receiving surgery for knee pain can help to reduce the pain, but it does not necessarily work how we think it does by fixing the injured knee tissues. If that was the case, then why did the placebo group do every bit as well, if not better? What we have is a situation where everyone received treatment that they believed fixed their knee. Thus, they felt their knee was safer and if the knee was safer, the subconscious alarm system had less need to draw attention to it and less need to get something done about it. There was less need for protection. Thus, there was less need to produce pain. In this last study, I would like to tell you about a study done here in the UK in a GP practice. It was published again in the British Medical Journal, that leading uh, medical journal. The GPs undertook the study because there was one GP in the practice who always seemed to get really good results and all the others thought it might be due to his positivity when he was consulting with his patients. So in the study, they investigated this. Volunteers were 200 patients for which there was no definitive diagnosis for their condition which actually accounts for many people attending their GP. These patients were randomized into one of four groups. A positive consultation with medication prescribed, group one. A positive consultation with no medication prescribed, group two. A negative consultation with medication prescribed, group three. And a negative consultation with no medication prescribed, group four. In the positive consultations, the patients were given a firm diagnosis and told confidently that they would be better in a few days, and were then given a prescription and told it would certainly make them better, or they were told that they did not need a prescription. In the negative consultations, the patients were told, I cannot be certain what is the matter with you, and then either I am not sure that the prescription I am going to give you will have an effect, or I am not sure that the prescription I am going to give you will have an effect and therefore I will give you no prescription. Patients were told were followed up in two weeks time and the results can be seen on this graph. 64% of people who received a positive consultation got better compared to just 39% of people in the negative consultation. There was a statistically significant difference between them. There was no real effect of receiving a prescription or not. In this study, the only difference was how positive the GP was. Can you think why this might have been the case, considering everything we have covered so far in this talk? To me, it comes back to safety and danger. The positive consultation gave the message that the patient was safe, whilst the negative consultation did not give that message. If they were safe, the subconscious alarm system had less need to draw attention to the potential problem and less need to get something done about it. Thus, there was less need to produce the pain. There was less need for that protection. Over the course of this session, we have learned about pain and changing your understanding of it away from the old outdated idea that pain is a marker of how injured your tissues are towards a newer more scientific understanding that pain is a marker of how much threat your subconscious alarm system believes your tissues to be under but why do you need to know this while it is interesting is it actually helpful for many people it is helpful and it can help in many ways. Firstly, many people with pain are often frustrated by not receiving a clear explanation for why they have their pain. 
they begin to question themselves and they can feel like they're not being believed because you can't see the pain. Is this something you can relate to or have experienced? This new scientific understanding of pain clearly shows that you can have terrible pain with little signs of tissue injury and why that might be the case. If someone truly understands this, it can be really validated, validating and liberating and can reassure them that their pain is real regardless of the state of their tissues. A lot of my own research studies involve talking to people with pain and exploring their understanding of their pain before and after receiving this education session. Here's a really nice quote from a lady talking about how the new understanding helped her to feel validated about her pain. I began to think, well, am I losing my mind, honestly? And then, when he was going through things, and that's me that, yeah, that's me that, I thought, God, it's not me going crazy. You know, it was brilliant. Secondly, many people are worried about what their pain may mean and what it might lead to. And this anxiety and concern about the pain can lead to things like avoidance of movement and activity. This is completely understandable. If you think pain means damage and it is painful to move, it seems perfectly reasonable to avoid movement. And when healthcare professionals prescribe exercise and it hurts, it would seem logical to think that exercise is not for me and it is just making things worse. But this new scientific understanding can give some people a sense of confidence to move and become more active. And there is a great deal of evidence to show that exercise can lead to significant reductions in pain and disability for people with persistent pain. While exercise can increase pain in the short term, the long term benefits have been shown time and time again and all national clinical guidelines for people with persistent pain are unanimous that it is a good thing for them to do. So this new understanding can help people to cope a bit better with their pain and to make more informed choices about their healthcare. Here is another quote from one of my study participants where this education helped them to get a bit more active. It's starting to come back now. I'm starting to do a little bit of cycling, a little bit of walking. In the same way, many clinical guidelines also encourage active, psychologically informed therapies like cognitive behavioural therapy, relaxation, meditation and mindfulness. If you believe that pain is simply influenced by the state of your tissues and how injured you are, it seems completely pointless to take part in these interventions. However, with a modern, scientifically informed understanding of pain, we know that pain is influenced influenced by a range of things, not just physical things, but our thoughts and our fears and the environment we are in. So it is perfectly reasonable that these active psychological therapies identified here can help with your pain and help you manage your pain better. We are now coming to the end of our session. To finish up, I would like to bring you back to the tasks we did at the very beginning, where I asked you to consider a number of questions. I'd like you to go back to those questions. They were, what are you hoping to get out of this online session? What do you think is causing your pain? What do you think the pain is telling you? Why do you think you have the pain? What is its purpose? Now, did you get what you hoped out of this online session? Has what you think is causing your pain changed? What do you now think your pain is telling you? And what do you now think is the purpose of your pain? In addition, midway through, I also asked you whether you agreed or disagreed with the following statements. If you have pain, then you must have injured tissues somewhere in the body. The greater the amount of pain, the greater the amount of injury. And if pain persists long term, that must mean the tissue injury has not healed. Do you still agree to the same amount or disagree to the same amount with these statements? 
can I ask you to pause the video again? Spend just five minutes looking at your previous answer and consider whether you still think the same or whether you would change your answers. When you're ready, pause it and then press play again when you're ready to move on. If you want to find out more, here are the sources of information that were used to make this educational session. This session is heavily based on the book Explain Pain, written by Professor Lorimer Mosley and Dr. David Butler from Australia, which you can see right here on the right. If you want to learn, learn more about pain science, this is a wonderful resource that has been written for patients, and I would highly recommend it. This is the final slide in the session. The aim of this session was to give you a new understanding of your pain that is more in keeping with modern pain science. This scientific understanding is quite different to the understanding that most people have. Most people, I believe, will be of the understanding that pain is simply the response to tissue injury. The greater the amount of pain, the greater amount of injury a person must have and they believe that long-term pain means that injury is not healed. We know now that this view is overly simplistic and incorrect. Pain is not something that simply occurs when we are injured. Pain occurs when our subconscious perceives a threat to our tissues. That threat level can be influenced by physical things such as tissue injury, but it can also be influenced by our thoughts and beliefs and our external environment. You can have terrible pain with little or no tissue injury, and you can have little or no pain with terrible injury. Finally, injuries heal, and when pain persists, it's due to our overactive alarm system continuing to fire. Understanding this, understanding that while you might be sore, you are safe, can be very liberating and it can help you make a lot of the right choices for your health care. Thank you for listening. I hope you found this session useful.